the creature from Jekyll Island. <laughs> so paint the picture. For those who don't know this story, yep. what, what is this uh, conspiracy theory and why is it true? So Alexander Hamilton was the first one to propose a, a national bank. There existed several national banks uh, that were wildly unconstitutional, uh, but the very people who passed the constitution said, okay, yeah, sure, we'll do this. Uh, they failed. They were shut down. They, their charges weren't renewed. So there are there are always these banking experiments where the government was involved in kind of a central national bank, but they'd always failed. And Britain had a central bank. Right. They were maybe maybe they might have been the first central bank if I'm remembering correctly. But yeah. yeah. So coming out of the English. Yeah, yeah. They had a lot of uh, systems in Europe to look to uh, by way of example, and that's why Hamilton was like, "Hey, we need one of those too. You can control, you know, the the production of money. You can control where it goes." And so those banks were eventually shut down and not renewed. And 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 in the early 1900s, there were a lot of bank. And there were a ton of banks, but they were all just private banks, little pop up banks here and there. And a lot of them would fail because they didn't really have a lender of last resort. They didn't have bailout opportunities, and so it was a risky entrepreneurial enterprise. Well, and I'll add one layer to that. That, which is um, in the Great Depression, there's something like 9,000 U.S. bank failures. Mm. And there was a Fed already. There was zero in Canada. Mm. And the reason for that is, is that people think, oh, well, we needed the Fed because there was all these bank failures and that run the, the 1907, you know, financial crisis. Right. J.P. Morgan had to bail out the bail out the treasury and that's crazy. And America has always had a weird banking system in which basically state level cronies, kind of like car dealerships, actually. Car dealerships <laughs> are structured like this. They have like these weird local monopolies. Yep. You couldn't have a bank. You couldn't even have branches in a state in most states, and you couldn't have branches across state lines, which means banks in the U.S. were very, very fragile because, like, what was a lot of the lending? A lot of the lending at that time was agricultural. Okay, we're planting our seeds. We need money. We need to borrow money at the start of the, of the season to plant our seeds and to get through until we have harvest. And... It turns out the weather affects all the farmers. Mm -hmm. So if you're a local bank and you've lent to all the farmers and then you have like extreme drought or a failed crop, they can't repay you and you go bust. Yeah. And that was happening all the time. Yeah. And, and this was not a failure of the free market. This wasn't like, well, that's why we need blah, blah, blah. It's like this was a very peculiar government created fake crisis. And, um, and yet who got the blame? Well, not the, not the government, not the policies. It was the market, right? The, yeah. the market is too volatile. This is a problem. The 1907 panic is, is exactly the backdrop of this situation. And of course, the bankers want, like any uh, uh, industry with all their protectionism, you know, sitting at the, the top perch of their industry, they want to be bailed out. They want securities. They want guarantees. They want to socialize their losses and make everybody else pay for them while they can concentrate those benefits. And there's one other component to this. I happen to be a geek on this one. Um, William Jennings Bryant there is, is, is like this really um, like a populist at the time mm -hmm. and is part of this free silver movement. There is a rural urban divide here, too. So one of the things that motivates keeping the banks all sort of protected is is this fear that, oh, the big New York banks will just run the whole show mm -hmm. and will all be uh, sort of subject to big New York-centered banks. So that, which, that was one of the other things going on there, which is this sort of populism that, yes. that made things worse. Even if you could sort of understand it, like people hated bankers forever. It goes back to the Bible and usury sure. laws. And, well, and there's glad, always been ignorance, basically. <laughs> but I'm glad you mentioned that because this is why the creature, creature from Jekyll Island uh, was born in such secrecy because it was the big money, it was the New York bankers, it was the politically connected banking cartel that designed the system that we have today. So what happened was you had Senator Nelson Aldrich, uh, who was over the like the finance committee, and he wanted to create a central bank. He wanted to say, oh, we're going to fix these market inequities and volatility, and we're going to have this one bank. So he had this fancy uh, train. He sa he says to all these different bankers and their their designees, their their associates, come meet me on this train under assumed name. Do not use what your name is. We're going to go on a duck hunting trip. So wear appropriate attire to fool everyone so that the reporters don't 
recognize you. You're just going to be all kind of dressed up and take your monocles off. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Put the no top aside. hats, guys. <laughs> exactly. Come on. <laughs> and so he says, you know, use an assumed name. Uh, we're going to keep this out of the papers. We don't want anybody to know. So they all end up on this train car. Not even the servants know what's going. Like everyone is kind of kept in the dark. And so Aldrich and everybody, they take the train down to Jekyll Island in Georgia, where there was this swanky resort. Still exists today. I went there a few years ago. Not swanky by today's comparisons. And J.P. Morgan uh, owned like half the resort. And so these guys went there and and yeah. kind of had accommodations for the week where they hold themselves up in a room and they architected in secret um, this this system that became the Federal Reserve. Of course, they had to go convince Congress and they had to get a public vote. So it's not like the entire thing was a conspiracy. The conspiracy was uh, who the actors were, how they were involved and what they were trying to foist on the public using kind of propaganda talking points about why we need this. But it was these bankers and politicians in a room that said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to construct this central bank. It will be the lender of last resort. We're going to bail out other banks. We're going to have this system of privately owned uh, banks across the country, this network that all the banks can have shares in. And so it creates this kind of like incestuous cycle where the the, the banks are bailed out by the banks of which they're a part and they can print their, like, it's just this genius. I mean, if you're a banker and, and, and a politician that wants access to easy money that you can just, you know, print and, and inflate um, to support your big budgets, it's a genius system. And uh, it was passed by Congress in 1913. This is Woodrow Wilson. Uh, One of his many fantastic. Oh, gosh. He was a great president, right? So let's let's just run down the list of Woodrow Wilson. Income hits. tax. 17th, so that's 16th Amendment. 17th Amendment, removing states uh, from uh, appointing who the senators are. Yeah, so that which, lost state representation in the Senate. Uh, World War I, Federal Reserve. Resegregating the federal exactly. government. <laughs> yep, yep. He was, in a sense, he's like the spirit animal for the modern technocratic elite. Mm. I, I think in a very real sense, you know, I remember Hillary Clinton at one point said, I'm a Woodrow Wilson progressive, which really needs to be properly understood because what is this? This was an academic that didn't even win the popular, they didn't even win a majority. He was, he only got in because there was a split, there was a split vote with I think Teddy Roosevelt or mm -hmm. a splinter mm -hmm. party. And just comes in as a utopian that thinks that we need to have an, a kind of Princeton educated managerial class running the show and proceeds to do stuff like create the most undemocratic institution in the United States, the Federal Reserve, yeah. among all these other think atrocities. Of, think, think of the income tax, right? These, these reforms are always introduced as the most benign and modest of reforms. Like the income tax, everyone was convinced, oh, this is only going to be on the, on the basically the top 1% type people, and it'll be this very minimal tax. We just, you know, and it's always just that camel's nose in the tent where you get something like the Federal Reserve or you get something like the income tax and it's justified as this minimalist thing, but then the foundation is set and they just build on it from there and, you know. They did a great job right away though, right? So it's not 1913, then immediately start printing money like crazy for World War I, yeah. cause a boom and bust, and then screw up in the opposite direction and create a Great Depression. They did a great job. I've, I've had a book concept. <laughs> uh, there, there's a genre called like, uh, what's it called? Like historical fiction. Like, what's the one where they go back and it's the Nazis actually won World War II? Oh, the Man in the High Castle. Man in the High Castle, right? Deeply so, upsetting TV show to watch. Very, you know, and and uh, but there's a genre of fiction that, that goes back in history and they change something and then you fast forward and you kind of see the impacts. And I've long thought about doing a book where there would be some time travel component to it and you go back to 1910, 1913, the dawn of the progressive era, Woodrow Wilson, the Federal Reserve, income tax, 17th Amendment, all these things that we're talking about. What would it look like to go back in time? And I mean, one aspect of the story is you just assassinate the right people and then you know, <laughs> hope nothing happens. A little more morally dubious. Yes. So, so the more morally appropriate one is what if there was like a, a Ron Paul revolution style awakening uh, back then? What if, what if you could go back and create this kind of uprising for individual freedom and get people to, to see the writing on the wall, to push back on the progressive agenda? What would today look like? Fast forward over 100 years. If we did not have the income tax, if we did not have the Federal Reserve, that like we think we're a prosperous culture, you know, I, I think the size of the government would be much lower. I think the prosperity and innovation would be much greater. The wars would be far fewer, which means we'd have more humans, which means more ingenuity. And, and it like it's so fascinating to think I, the utopians that we've been talking about, the Francis Bellamy's and the Horace Mann's and all these guys like they fashion themselves as utopians or the collectivists and others. 
But man, I think like what, how much better could the world be if we did not have all these policies in the past that we've had? I don't know that I'll ever write the book, but when we talk about Woodrow Wilson in 1913, I often kind of think, man, the world could be so much better, uh, different in a good way today had we not gone through all that and laid those foundations that FDR built on and everyone after him. If you like that clip, we've got a lot more where that came from. Be sure to check out our full conversations by subscribing to the channel so you won't miss our new videos as they come out each week.